Melinda, it's been over a month since we last talked. It's been a little while. What's going on? What are we going to talk about today? I want to come out with a brand strategy kit or e-course or something along those lines. I've started an email list for it, but I, I don't really know how to head towards that to actually get to the point where I'm coming out with the e-course or the kit or whatever it ends up being. So what's your question? How do I sell an e-course? How do you sell brand strategy? Have you made the commitment that you're going to start to do less client work or is this in addition to all the client work that you're doing? I've made a commitment to do less. So I have one, I have a couple stragglers, but one main brand strategy client that I'm working on right now. But my plan is to slowly, as I can afford to, slowly phase out the clients so that I can focus solely on this. Okay. So I'm in transition period. So we're talking we're talking about marketing right now, right? We're talking about how to get the word out, how to build interest in your product. So let's take a step back. Before you created this brand strategy kit, who has a problem? that's worth solving? Who are the people that need something like this? Let's try and understand that. Well, it's designers that Mm -hmm. are sick of being order takers. So where I was before, right before I learned brand strategy. For people who may not understand this, what does that mean? Like designers who are tired of being order takers? Can you describe some of the symptoms? Yeah. So their clients are telling them what to do. They're playing art director, or this is how the designer sees it. So They just feel pushed around from their client. Um, The client's making very subjective design decisions. And really the designer is there as the hands and the knowledge to execute whatever it is that the client wants. So there's no real uh, objective goal that they're trying to reach. It's just, oh, I don't like that the color of the logo is purple and I like green better. So they're making extremely subjective decisions. Okay. And usually they're getting paid not that well either. Where did the epiphany come for you in terms of your transition from being that exact person that you described? How did you get there? And how are you going to help people who were there and who aren't even aware of this? Like, well, how would you speak to them? I would first identify and validate where they're at. So understanding the pain that they're currently experiencing specifically with being the order taker. Because I remember that being the top issue for me is that I wanted to bring more value to my clients. I wanted to solve bigger problems, but I just had no idea how to get out of that position that my client saw me in as just, as I call it, the design slave that just does what they're told and doesn't use their creative problem-solving skills or isn't, isn't in an environment to be able to do that. Now, when you were a design slave, your words, not mine, did you feel like a slave? Were you frustrated at the point? Oh, yeah. And but, what yeah. did you feel like doing? Like, what was going on in your mind at that time? I felt like quitting. Like, I felt like I made the wrong decision, career decision. I really did. And I was looking into other avenues. Like, what, what career were you looking at? Oh, my gosh. Like, holistic living. Like, anything <laughs> along that. I was interested in that at the time. Um, really, I was. I was looking into that. Um whatever i don't know i was are these like crystals and no 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 like nature path like uh anything in that field what what Um, was that term again naturopath naturopath yeah so like holistic doctors and were you going to become a doctor or sell supplies or what what was that i didn't know i was just interested in that whole okay thing so i was like ooh, and then that is when i came and during that whole time of I don't want to be doing this anymore. I discovered Pat Flynn of Smart Passive Income. And I thought, well, passive income, this is interesting. And so that's when I started listening to podcasts and getting more information on what that looks like. But even then, I thought, well, maybe I would go into a different industry and make passive income through that. I was I was lost. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew that what I currently was doing was not working for me and that I was done Okay, so I'm hearing something here. The old you, the design slave you, was tired of the world that she had found herself in in one day and just realized, oh my gosh, this is not what I thought my life was going to be. 
and then you were actively searching for something even though you didn't know what that thing was. You just didn't want to be here. So you're out, you're out there and you became curious about this idea of passive income and for whatever reason, Pat Flynn hit your radar. And what what about that spoke to you? And what other things were you considering at that time? Well, once I heard that podcast, that was that became the focal point of what I wanted to do. And I and he had on a ton of different people on his podcast. And what I consistently saw was that these people were finding a problem and they were solving it. And they were being problem solvers. So it was something that I was craving. I was craving to solve problems. I was craving to be more than just either a design slave, production artist. I wanted more than that. And I saw that everyone that was on the podcast, whatever industry they ended up being in, they were problem solvers. And so that was what attracted me to that. Hmm. Okay. Okay. And so now you're, you're like, you, you figure out, I think, some kind of general direction that you want to be a problem solver, that you want to be more than just hands. You want to use all parts of your brain and not just your, your design skill, right? Right. Okay, so now you're going towards a path. So first you have to realize there's a problem. You're dissatisfied with the way things are, the status quo. And then you, for whatever reason, hit this thing. So we have to reverse engineer the young Melinda to find the new Melinda and to help her along the way. Yeah? I think so, yeah. So how did you find Pat Flynn? I think I heard the term passive income. And I thought, well, that sounds interesting. And so I was looking up that and then I came across Pat Flynn. So what what, pa- what part of passive income was interesting to you? Why did the that fact, resonate with you? I think it's the fact that the day-to-day design life that I was living was a grind. And so it was a constant that if I was not attending to something, it's going to fall apart. If I didn't answer my client's phone call when they needed something sent it right now, then they're going to go to someone else. And it everything was writing on me every single day, every single minute. At least that's what it felt like. So then when I heard the term passive income, I thought, great. So I can work really hard and I can develop systems. I can develop something that's going to run on its own that sure, I'll put in a lot of work ahead of time, but at least it'll pay off. Whereas when I was doing the design work and unhappy and doing it, it was it was like trading my time for money. So I think from what I'm hearing from you that this thing that popped up on your radar was the exact opposite of what you're going through right now and that you felt a slave in your words to the client. You you weren't having agency over yourself and your time and your career and your life. And the idea of passive and income, those two words are great put together, spoke to you. Now, if young version of you wanted to jump past the passive income part and arrive at the strategy part, what words would you have to use so that person knew, wow, I didn't know that this was something I even needed. So you have to like educate Mm -hmm. them on the problem Mm -hmm. even more so than the solution. Yes. And I, and I know I tell my clients that too, but doing it for myself, I do get caught up in the solution so much. Yeah. So what is the problem then? And then ultimately you'll provide a solution for them. And then so, how will you yeah. reach them? So which one do you want to start with first? How, Both. What's the problem? Yeah, what's the problem? The problem is feeling trapped in a design job or um, a design job they're either in or a design job they created for themselves if they're working with clients that they're unhappy in, that they feel that they are order takers, that they feel that their clients are art directors, that they are not able to use their problem solving skills. And that they're essentially trading their time for money. Now, can you just say this to me like I'm a fifth grader and strip out all the language and the whole order taker thing? Just speak from your heart and tell me what it is that if you were talking to the young Melinda, what would you say to her? Well, what, what, can you give me a question? Cause I'd. Hey, yeah, Melinda, you know, so I, I, I'm just doing this design thing that I learned in school. Is, is there more to this? Yes, there is. There, I'd have to get how you feel. So what are you struggling with? What are your issues that are coming up okay. for you as a designer? I need something to go <laughs> off of. Okay, okay. Because I already kind of have the answer in my mind. I just wanted to try to lead you there. 
So here's what I would do. I'm, I, well, it's easier for me because I'm looking at you, not like you're looking at your old self. So it's a lot easier for me to pretend. Okay, so here's how I would talk to you. I would say, hey, Melinda, you went to design school. You learned how to make amazing things and you have all this craftsmanship. And I think you were either promised a dream or you were sold a dream, either of your own doing, uh, unwittingly, but this idea that you can be this creative human being and to make an impact on the world. But when you graduated school, you find out in the real world it doesn't work like that, that most clients do not respect the creative input of designers. And you wind up doing things that they tell you to do because you need to put money uh, uh, in the, you got to put food on the table and money in the bank account. And after years of doing this, you're going to wake up one day and you're going to realize to yourself, is there more to my life than just being told what to do? That the promise of being a creative turned out that you're just more listening to what other people tell tell you to do. And you feel like you've lost all control and all agency over the entire design creative process. And this could lead you to a very dark black hole. One of depression, one of just low creative fulfillment, and you're gonna to start to feel really burnt out. Now, luckily for you, there's an entirely different path that you can take. Unfortunately, this is not taught in school. And it's something that I've learned that I want to share with you. And it's this thing called strategy. And strategy is a fancy word for a plan of action to get from point A to point B. And it involves a higher level of thinking where you can actually understand what the client's goals are, separate their wants from their needs, and then determine with them, not for them, what course of action they need to take. And this is the thing that I've learned that has radically changed my life and my design business, so much so that now I have a seat at the table, I'm speaking to the decision makers, the key stakeholders at companies, and we're not talking about just small mom and pop companies, we're talking about large, multi-billion dollar organizations. And I never thought, looking back when I was in school, that I would ever have the confidence or the skill set to be able to do this, because I didn't have a business degree. I don't, I'm not really fascinated by numbers, but Learning about how to do strategy has empowered me to do so in ways that I never thought possible. And it's something if you're interested in, it might pull you out of that darkness. That's it. That was amazing. That's how, that's what that's I thought true. you were going to say to me. I was, yeah. <laughs> well, that, here's where I get hung up. That was perfect. Yes. Here's where I was struggling with is knowing who was... I struggle with knowing who I'm talking to because there are some designers who do know. So it's like, do I talk to the designer that does know about strategy that wants to do it, but doesn't have the resources for it yet? Or do I talk to way back? How far back do I go? And I, and that's where my, I think my biggest struggle is at this moment. I think when you have clarity of who your audience is, as Seth Godin said, you don't get speakers block. You're just going to speak to somebody. You just need to know who you're talking to. So this is one of the most useful exercises from the framework that we teach in that you do user profiles and you try to understand the archetype. Like, who is this person? So when I was talking to you, I wasn't really talking to you. I was talking to a composite version of you over hundreds of correspondences that I have with people online on our YouTube channel, on Twitter, on Instagram, telling me about this dark path that they're on and they just are trying to come up and catch air and reach towards the light. And I envision them and I want to talk to them in very empathetic tones, non-judgmental, and just say like we were sold a promise, a dream that has not been realized. We were given, you know, in Martin Luther King Jr.'s speak, a check that we can't cash. We we're made empty promises. Or we were given empty promises that we can't cash in on. And especially today in the 21st century, now more than ever, the world needs creative problem solvers and abstract thinkers. That's what we need. So I think you just need to zero in on who this person is. And sometimes if you don't have clarity over that, you can just read their comments, as I've mentioned to you before, in forums, in communities, so that you can find out like, wow, I keep hearing the same problems over and over again. I understand what Billy is struggling with. I understand what Mary's going through. So I think you need to understand who your audience is and, and really empathize with their pain point and their, their challenges 
so that you can speak to them. Yeah, that's true. Because by the time that I learned about brand strategy, I was already a year in to my frustration. Well, yeah. probably two, probably two years in. So I had already looked at all those other, well, I see where you're getting at. <laughs> I was aiming my view at the person who I was right on the cusp of actually wanting to learn it, not yeah. when they're having that pivotal. Because if I would have been able to hear those things earlier mm-hmm. when I was in that state, mm-hmm. yeah, okay, it's quick. You have to just rewind the tape a little bit. Yeah. You took it to the point in which you were ready to go. At that point, anybody's ready yeah. to go. And there are fewer of those people out there. Whereas if yeah. I'm in school still and you send me this message, I would sit up and think, oh my God, what am I not getting? So a lot of people, sadly, are motivated by what they have to lose, not what they have to gain. So that that whole FOMO, fear of missing out, people won't take action because they have something to gain, but they'll take action because they're missing out on something. So at the beginning of that little monologue I shared with you, I was really trying to paint a very clear picture that, man, is this all I've got? Isn't there more to this? I think I'm missing something here, aren't I? So lean into that. Lean into what school is really good for teaching you in terms of design. Until a certain point, you start to realize, oh my God, there's a lot that they're not teaching me just by describing it. Steve Jobs did this masterfully. He did this masterfully. And Nancy Duarte talked about it in her TED Talk about when he went to unveil the iPhone, the very first one 10 years ago. He did a really great job of showing you the way things are and the way he presented the way things are. It started to make you, be, you made, he made me feel angry and feel like, God, there's got to be better. And he kept talking about the way things are for a really long time. And then finally he's like, I got this thing I've been working on for the past few years. I want to show it to you. It's, it's a phone, it's a web browser, it's a media device. And he kept going on and on and it's like, it's just one thing. And then he let the beast out and the audience awed with him like a gasp of air was let out you know it's amazing so you can you can start your marketing copy or just the storyline just like here's probably what you're learning in school if you went to a decent design school about color about typography layout composition about how to sequence images together and some schools are actually very good at doing that but the minute you step into the real world, you start to learn that there's a lot more to it than just that. What am I talking about? And then you go into it. Mm-hmm. So paint a very rich, vivid picture of what schools are good at. And by contrast, when you're ready to tell them that there's more, they're like, oh my God, you're right. I'm missing all these things. So a question really quick. Well, painting the picture of what school is good for, would you also incorporate... You'd, you'd also be saying what it's not, right? You what are implying what it's not. Yeah, so you're doing it in an earnest way. You're not trying to do it like you're dissing on school right away. You're just saying this is what it's really good for. When you say that, I automatically start to assume and think, what's it not good for then? Mm. Maybe. Mm-hmm. But you're trying to attract those people who are going from school to the real world and starting to hit on these things right away you're going to catch them earlier in the process Mm -hmm. and you start to bring them in but the problem will be this the problem will be this and i'm just going to be very honest about this why would they pick you over us are you saying we're competition chris i don't know are we i don't see us as competition hmm But the people that are in the market for this thing, because we sell quite a few of these things. I'm not saying this as a challenge to you. I'm just saying this just to be clear about your positioning. Okay. So that they're they're forced to make a decision. Like, I want this flavor. Like, like, if you say we're we're setting up two ice cream shops, you're in trouble, right? You understand that. If we're setting up two ice cream shops, because I have 12 people working for me, and we have a four-year head start on you on doing this and selling it and building an audience around this. Mm-hmm. But if you say like, Chris, you're, you're selling ice cream, but I'm selling handmade, whatever mm-hmm. scoops of chocolate. And that's totally different than what you're doing. So I'm forcing you to pick a lane and to be very clear about it. 
So then when it, so that's introduced down in the sales cycle at the end, right? Or is it, or is it, yeah. I don't, I don't think you're going to wait for the end because you wait for then. They're like, fantastic, Melinda, let's go to Chris. Well, and I encourage people to go to you too, even for your strategy kit. I do. And then some end up, a lot end up coming back to me because yours is the foundational piece. Mine has my unique design spin, design thinking. My own personality or the way I think. I don't know how to define that. So you have to let that out. And is it just the personality? So you have to figure that out, right? I think, no, it's not just the personality. I think it's the way, the way in which it's processed, like the, the thinking of it. The way I think is different than the way you think than Jose. Like we all have our certain way we go about handling information. So. Okay, so you have to be different, why. but better. Because different for different is, okay. You have to be different, but better. So here's my, and I could totally be wrong. This is only my perspective of one brand strategist. I want to learn everyone's I can so that I can make my own. So I didn't make my strategy kit just by just learning core and then adjusting it. I was talking to all of my different friends that are doing it as well. I was taking in their, their things that they updated. Like it was all this, this compounding effect. So in my perspective as a brand strategist, I would want to go buy everybody's that I, that I knew or that I respected and then create my own out of it. Right. So is that what you've done? Well, I don't know of anyone that else that's selling it, but yeah. <laughs> but it books, So this yeah. is theoretical. No, yes, yes, well, no, I get really. it. No, really. Like I've learned from, because not everybody has kits that are out, but people it's have true. written books on it. So why do we read five books of the same topic? It's because everybody has different information to give you. Right. Me. And so, so this is what I'm asking. That. Right. So this is what I'm asking of you is how do you carve out your own version? And I'm in support and cheering for you to do your version. I just want to be clear that you have a version that's that's different. Maybe we just need to set up the system to teach you how to do strategy, but to teach you how to sell it to other people who want to be strategists. And then, and then you guys just ripple down. Or I know, you do the similar thing that we were talking about previously about affiliate marketing. No, not, not just that, yes, affiliate marketing, but marketing that. telling you how to sell the course. Yeah. So most people yeah. like Lewis House, he sells a course on how to do webinars while he's doing the webinar. So it's like what? Like inception. It is inception a little bit That's funny. because he's he's done a lot of the trial and error to figure out how best to do a webinar so that you have the best shot of success. And there are other people too. They basically teach you how to do what it is that they're doing, but it what they're doing is marketing. Yeah. The problem with Lewis House model is he doesn't teach you how to do the hard stuff, which is what if I have nothing to say? How do I teach? So he's teaching you the mechanics of setting it up, but not really that you have anything worthwhile to teach. Mm-hmm. And that's where the real conflict comes in, right? Mm-hmm. But he delivered on his promise. It's just there's a huge hole there as to like, what are you going to teach? So I have this idea. I got this idea I'm going to share with you right now. Okay. Mm-hmm. You're a learned person. You went to a good school. You, you, you went and took, what is that class? Something anthropology that you told me before. That linguistic anthropology? Linguistic, yeah. You're like, yeah. okay, so you, you took linguistic anthropology, which sounds like an amazing class. Wish I had it. I've been thinking about this. I've been looking at writers, influencers, authors, public speakers, and they seem to approach things like, when we were in college, <clears throat> when we were in college or high school, you had to write a thesis paper and you had to research and you would go in for a whole semester, research, write, formulate ideas and you would write this paper. And I was thinking like, gosh, a lot of people in the creative space don't think like this. But this is how you get known. You go and research, you write, you uncover really interesting stories and you put it all together and none of it's new, but the way that you package it and the information and the stories you dig up are novel and at least they're new to this specific audience. That if you did that, you could build your own entire life and career around one product. 
So that's the thought there. Like, what if you, Melinda, said in the next six months, I'm going to write my thesis paper. So I have some ideas. I'm going to go deep into research mode. I'm going to do a deep dive. I'm going to learn about all these kinds of things and theories about positioning, marketing, copywriting, business, whatever it is that you need to learn. To have like a stack of 10 books that you just go through and devour, tear pages apart, highlight things, and you start to write this paper. And then you start to build the visuals to support it. And then you can go and create the kit. You can go and lecture about it. You can do pieces of micro content and just really illuminate the subject in ways that people have not seen or heard before. Yes, that is along the lines of some things that I've been thinking. But I like the way that you package that with the... Because that's a world that's familiar to you, right? Yeah. So as I was talking to our friends uh, that are releasing products, I feel like many of them are just so quick to regurgitate what they've learned, either from our kit or other books, but they haven't done the deep dive. They haven't spent the time to put all this stuff together. Now, Seth Godin is an amazing example of a person who does this because he tells the story of Icarus, right? That everybody knows the story of Icarus, that Icarus had wings made of wax, so when he flew to the sun, the wings melted and he plummeted to his death. And he said that the story had been changed. So he went back and studied the story and told us something new about that. And he's like, it's a cautionary tale about not flying too close to being too big for your ambition, but it's also about not flying too low. And that video on Facebook has millions of views. Seth didn't invent a story. He just found out something about a story that we all think we knew and brought some new light to it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you can do. That's what everybody that's watching this later could also do. To sit there and think, yes, while I'm doing my day work, the grind, I'm going to go away. I'm going to write my thesis paper as if an assignment to myself and I want to dive deep. It could be about naming. It could be about like one concept. Because I listen to a lot of TED Talks. I listen to a lot of public speakers. And they generally, most of them, have one core concept. Simon Sinek made his name on Start With Why. He went into research the Wright brothers and found out this other part of the story about competitor competitors trying to do the same thing. But they weren't. Uh, motivated by the idea of flight they were just doing it as a business idea to try to make money and he would tell all these stories so you could be a probably a really great storyteller and by doing the research I'm, i think you're gonna find something that would like make it the, very unique yeah well this is giving me clarity too because i the plan is to be sharing stories yes and i already have been from my brand strategy workshops and they're just, they're usually about one one thing, like finding the one word for a brand and then diving into what was the actual conversation like? How did that come about? How did we end up there? So it's telling the story. So the whole blog part is called strategy stories. So telling my story in that, but I love the idea of having like a thesis statement. Like if there's one thing that I consistently always get out of strategy with a client, then just zero in on that and circle that circle that that topic yes like your one profound Mm -hmm. world-changing idea or observation then backed up by lots of things so i I think we're getting towards the end of this conversation and i I do want to say this to try to make this super clear for everybody okay which is this is that most of the times if i told people what to do and they did it and they would be super successful and happy and work less and be more productive. But I find that that's not the answer. That the problem is helping them to realize they want to do that one thing. And I've not been very good as a teacher this way in that I want to tell you 35 things that you can do and you'll do none of them. Not you, Melinda, but people. So now I'm spending a lot of time trying to unpack human psychology, behavior, thought patterns, and see what I need to do to prime you to want to make that change. And once you do that, you're going to be really successful. If you listen to a lot of Tony Robbins, he does this, where he reiterates the problem over and over and over again to a point in which you are like, my God, I'm so ready now, Tony. So that these stories will hit somebody in the audience at a point in which it will hit 
all the people in the audience and then they're ready and it'll say like do this thing now that's what I lack so we have to be a better storyteller in helping people to understand that this relates to them this is a problem worth solving to such a point which they feel like now they have to take action they're compelled to take action and this is the answer I'll give you an example now to make it a little bit more tangible you know I've been talking a lot about pricing and not selling your time based on hours so I have a researcher working with me right now because I started to think about where does money commerce and transaction how did that come to play like in the beginning of time I would catch some fish and you made a basket since you're not a good fisherman and I don't know how to weave we would sit there and like okay I'll give you two of these fish for your basket maybe if you're really hungry you're like oh, okay I'll take the deal and if you weren't hungry you're like no 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 I want four fish from the basket and this out so it was a value exchange right it wasn't really based on money at all and somewhere along the way we thought to ourselves as a civilization it's inconvenient for me to truck fish everywhere and for you to carry baskets everywhere so somebody invented currency as a substitute so we say well this one object that we all agree to is worth something so I'll give you four of these coins for two of your fish and those four coins are also coincidentally what will give me the basket when we start to understand this maybe we have a different relationship with money and selling time because it's always been about exchanging value it's never been about time because we don't care how long you were on the water fishing before you caught those two fish and we don't care how many years it took for you to learn how to weave that basket we don't care we just either want the basket because it's valuable to us or it's not so that's what I'm going to do now I'm gonna go back into the history of humankind and understand commerce so I can tell a better story so that people can then understand that this idea of selling time is crazy then I want to get into the Industrial Revolution why we have to punch in on a clock and then we start to train our, our people our culture that your worth is your time something happened there maybe we have to get into capitalism Marxism and socialism I don't know economic theories about time and money and people and value that's what I'm going to do so that's going to be my thesis except for I'm outsourcing all the research I just have the general ideas nice you can take six months to do it or no maybe faster me yeah no I won't take any time because somebody smarter and, and has more <laughs> free time will do it I, I see I know the argument but when I tell people the argument it feels like a lot of subjective feelings and opinions but if I told them historically this is what happened so I have to win them with the heart I have to win them with the logic in order for them to understand the concept so then they can then move forward but these are the things that I have tons of pieces of paper floating around like I'm a crazy person just writing down notes and ideas because mm-hmm. I could easily tell you Melinda just charged three times as much and you'll say I can't be done it can't be done now I have to go in and unpack everything and help you get there mentally to rationalize it with you for you so that then you can say Chris I am now ready to charge three times as much because now I believe I'm worth it that's the hard Mm. work so then are you are you using this whole thesis the research you'll be talking about this so this would be the awareness portion right yes talking about the problem yes so then when someone is fully convinced that's when they're going further down the funnel yes and then working potentially working with you in one way shape or form whether that's yes yes but i don't even care i mean i'm this weird business person i teach people how to like make money but then i'm not really motivated by money in that same way that i just want to help people make money and there's no course per se there's not even a product or a funnel i'm just thinking i want to help you understand why exchanging time for money is not a good idea for you I mean if I can help you then maybe somewhere down the line you'll help me and that's what people have done it's the law of reciprocity but I'm talking about now it's switching gears a little bit very specifically for you yes you're going to help them understand the problem really well mm-hmm. so that they want the solution really badly mm-hmm. and when you do that then your whole 
funnel, your sales funnel will all make sense. And I'm even reluctant to say sales funnel because it's such a marketing term for people out there. Really, what you're trying to do is you're trying to educate people and you actually have a problem for those people who want the solution that you're offering. That's all Mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes, that helps. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'm going to wrap up this episode now. And thank you again, Melinda, for being so transparent, vulnerable, and telling us what your problems are and updating us. And I'm sure uh, along with our audience, they're very interested to see where this nets out. So I will see you next time.